There's a popular video on the internet today. Some of you may have seen it. It's of this little girl with blonde hair who is dressed up, very nice. And her mother is videoing her. And the little girl is visibly crying. And the mother is asking her, are you crying? And the little girl is denying the fact that she's crying. And she's saying, no, I'm smiling. And the mother obviously is saying, oh, you're smiling, huh? Yeah, I'm happy. It's one of the most heart-wrenching videos I've ever seen. A child being shamed for their feelings. Another little vignette. Two friends of mine, Evan and Corrine Powell, who live in Connecticut, no relation to our Father Joseph Powell, or if they are, it's very distant. And I was over their house, and we were all chatting in the kitchen, and their daughter comes in and was looking for a particular snack at a particular moment, and her mother told her to wait. And the girl did one of those tantrum uh, dances, the little jump. And the mother said to her, it's okay that you're angry, but use your words. And when I saw that, when I saw the respect and the love that was there, it warmed my heart. The child was given permission to have her feelings. She was just given the slight correction as to how best to express them. Because brothers and sisters, we celebrate the feast of the Holy Family today, but Again, like many of the mysteries that we celebrate, we're not just looking at the Holy Family and saying, isn't that great, and then going home and living our lives as if we have nothing to do with the Holy Family. It is instead that they're presented to us as an example that what is happening with them can happen with us. Now, many times when we hear this gospel today, we think that Jesus was somehow being flippant to his parents When he said to them, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Of course, for us as North Americans, some kind of implication that we didn't know something can sometimes be like we all get embarrassed as if, you know, we somehow don't, aren't up to snuff because we don't know something because knowledge is so uh, valued here. But Jesus is literally, as a young man, 12 years old, coming to realize that he hears things from the Father that his parents may not. And so then what we see happening is this. When Jesus recognizes this, it mentions that he then went down back to Nazareth, back to Nazareth, excuse me, and was obedient to Joseph and Mary. In other words, He listened to them and he recognized what their needs were. When I'm counseling couples who are about to get married, we talk about the greatest bonder of a couple, and that's communication. It's the most important of the three major bonders. The other two major bonders are common life, that is common possessions, that includes money. That's the second most important bonder. And then the third, of course, is the gift of sexuality. But communication being so important, because many times we don't recognize that we're withholding from people. It's almost as if for us as human beings, we have this level of shame for the mere fact that as human beings, we were created dependent upon other people. God didn't create us to be self-sufficient, which again, smacks against the norms and the ideology of 21st century America today, which basically says you have to be free and independent and you have to be self-contained. That's not the case. All of us, when we are conceived, are conceived dependent upon other people. When we come out of the womb, we receive before we're able to give back. 
I don't see any parent that immediately demands of their infant that that child be able to do dishes or earn an income in order to support, help support the family. Do any of you? No. So there is room for growth. There is room in family for continuing to be patient, to recognize need. We see in the first reading, we have the example of Hannah. And Hannah had the best kind of communication possible. She poured out before God everything that was in her heart, all of the bitterness and disappointment and sadness that she had at not being able to conceive. And God, who is merciful, accepted, received her heart. And as it says, you know, cast your cares upon the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust in the Lord. Was it a bad desire that she looked to have a son or that she looked to have a child? Yes or no? You don't seem too convinced. Was it a bad desire for her to want to have a child? No. No. Okay. All right. It's not bad. It's a normal human desire. And many times what happens, brothers and sisters, is that we, kind of like the woman in the video that I mentioned first, we won't necessarily, well, sometimes we'll shame others, yes, but first we'll shame ourselves for natural human goodness. Like if we get angry, we assume that it's automatically a sin. Not so. Jesus tells us what to do with anger. He says not to direct it at a person, because then you go down the line of uh, reviling the person and eventually wanting to kill them. And St. Paul reminds us, if you are angry, let it be without sin. Anger, in and of itself, is geared to protecting the good of self and protecting the good of others. If somebody were to place a child up here and an adult were to come and just backhand the child in front of all of us, If somebody wasn't angry in here, I would think they had a mental illness. That there was something wrong with them. Because to just haul and slap a child for no good reason isn't isn't right. Just like when I was in Market Basket and a gentleman who was so much in a hurry actually hit a child with with his cart. And the mother, instead of blaming the man, blamed the child for being in the way. And I I got mad. I told the man, I said, sir, you should pay attention where you're going. You just hit that child. Is it right to say that kind of a thing? Yes. Did I demean him? No. I didn't call him names. I did express my anger. But this, brothers and sisters, goes to show what is necessary in family life. Freedom. Each person, first and foremost, not just listening to God. Because sometimes we have this tendency to think that we have to only listen to God. And therefore we get you know, upset over the fact that sometimes we don't know whether we're hearing God or not. But even learning with the safest and most loving being that we know, God, being able to take everything that's going on within us, sadness, happiness, anger, joy, disappointment, whatever it may be, and presenting it before God, asking God for the graces that we need. Even things as, as holy as desire. Because again, this is one of the things where people will guilt themselves on. Holy desire. God made humanity normally to be a communion of man and wife, right? Of husband and wife, male and female. And he placed in them a desire for one another. That they may want to be together, that they may want to receive. One of the areas where I often have to discuss with couples that are 
um, in engaging in marriage prep is often the case that there's one of the questions on the focus inventory, and it says, you know, we consider our relationship with each other, we consider the, 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 the fullness of the, of the marriage relationship that we're going to be having to be an expression of God's love for us. And most of the time, rarely have I ever had somebody say, yes, we agree to that, and for both of them to say that. Because for some reason, and I don't understand why, maybe it's one of the lies of the devil, for some reason we assume that that kind of marital intimacy is somehow separate from God. And it's not. We may recognize that there are times when that kind of intimacy outside of marriage, or in the wrong way, or in the improper way, may be sinful. But it's because you don't take good china and give, put dog food on it and put it on the ground for the dog to eat out of, right? Does anybody do that? No. So likewise, a very precious gift you utilize in celebration, the right times, the right moments. Oftentimes, Counseling men or even women if they're struggling with purity. I remind them ask God to help you to know what's going on within you. Because sometimes our communication, even with ourselves, gets disrupted. And we need God who searches our heart and our soul to show us what's going on because He gives us knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, right? Okay? So that when we know what's going on, we can understand what is the good need that is going on within me? What is the good need, the good and holy desire that's present, that's looking for some fulfillment? And how can I meet that in a good and holy way? And God can show us. And sometimes it means husbands and wives being a bit more vulnerable with each other, saying, hey, my love tank is a little low. I need some affection. Because, brothers and sisters, what happens sometimes is that we are afraid to be vulnerable. And when we fear that vulnerability, we literally cut ourselves off from sources of grace. The fact that we are human beings and made dependent, made with needs and desires that are desiring what's good, this is not a bad thing. It just smacks right in front of the ideology of the world that basically says that we're self-contained and supposed to be our own little gods. Because we're not. We're instead made in the image and likeness of Jesus, the Son of God. We are first called to receive, and then we give back. In our relationship with God, we receive Jesus today in this Eucharist, in his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So that filled with all the goodness of heaven, we can then go and share the goodness of heaven with others. And brothers and sisters, I don't claim to be a relationship expert. I don't claim to be one that has all the answers about how families can live a holy life. But I do know somebody who does. And that's God. So when we invite God in to help us to recognize what's going on with us and what's going on with others, that we can then honor each other, honor the different needs and the different desires that are good and holy, and so love each other. So we ask God to do that today, to give us that knowledge and that understanding and that practical wisdom of knowing how to act to help meet our own needs and to meet the needs of others and to respect each other in all of their feelings and allowing everything to be communicated just only in the proper way. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I think it wasn't until 2018, yeah, 2018, that I didn't, that I finally realized that God doesn't just ask us to go without. 
You know, sometimes we may have experienced lack in family or even in relationships, that kind of a thing. God doesn't ask us to just go without. So I remember reading in, in the Gospels the, the section where Jesus says um, to those who, have, who are following him, there's not anybody who gives up brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, lands, houses, etc., for the sake of the kingdom, who will not receive all the more a hundred times in this life those things with persecution and eternal life and life to come. Sometimes we think it's just the persecution and the eternal life. God actually wants us to experience blessing here. But we have to know to say to the Lord, God, this is what I need. You know what I need. And when we do that, God does provide. So even if we haven't experienced the best of family life, God can still bring healing. And you didn't think I was going to mention healing today, did you? 